Hello YouTubers and welcome back to my channel. It is Dr. Rosie here to talk to you about some of the most common skin conditions we see in adult population in the clinical setting. Before I go on to talk to you about four of the top most common ones that we see, if you enjoy my page, if you're here to learn, if you're here to grow, please subscribe and or share it with someone who you think can benefit and learn from all the stuff that I'm here to share with you. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to talk about four of the common rashes. We'll probably do a part two to talk about a couple more rashes and or involve children rashes, which are oh so common. These rashes, I'm going to just precursor with, are very common, are quite benign. One of them is a bit more frustrating than the rest. Are typically diagnosed clinically, meaning you don't need to see a dermatologist necessarily. You don't need special tests. It's pretty obvious on history and on physical exam what they are and are often treated with over-the-counter medication. Not all, but some. Keep in mind, this is for educational purposes. So if ever you have a doubt, if ever you have questions, please see your healthcare provider to get more information on the rash that you're experiencing. All right, let's get right into it. Rash number one, Tyriasis rosea. As it sounds, it is a reddish looking rash. It usually lasts six to 12 weeks in duration. I know, kind of frustrating. It's a viral rash though, which is reassuring because it's absolutely benign, not dangerous at all. You typically will have one episode in your lifetime and what it really is, theoretically, a reactivation of roseola, which if you know, is a very, very common rash in little kids. Around the age of zero to one years old, they get this full body rash, a couple of days of fever. And basically we get that as an adult. Sometimes we'll have a viral prodrome, meaning cough, runny nose, such and such, and then have this rash kind of show up all almost over the body. Happens in all age groups. We're talking about adults here. It is generally gonna present with a first off something called a herald patch, which is a big red patch somewhere on your trunk typically again. And then it's from that gonna go more widespread into multiple small patches that are red and oval in shape, typically. You wanna Google it, you'll see. I'm gonna throw in a couple photos here. How is it diagnosed? Typically, clinically. We see it, we hear your story, we know what it's not, we know what it is, and we make the diagnosis. Is it treatable? Yes and no. It's a virus, so it passes on its own. We treat the symptoms as needed. So what are the symptoms? Typically none at all, sometimes a bit of an itch. So we, t we tend to prescribe over-the-counter antihistamines, which is something you can find on your own, Reactin, Claritin, Allegra, all those fun things to avoid that itch. If it's really bothersome, and since it lasts multiple weeks, it might be, and it might be something you wanna control as a symptom. However, otherwise we talk about light moisturizers, um, fragrance-free, taking a mild bath or shower, nothing really hot or really cold, and avoiding sun exposure, because that might make it a little bit worse. Next rash is called Tyriasis versicolor. So this is another rash which presents as hypo or hyperpigmented little patches on typically our trunk, our neck, or our arms, areas where we tend to perspire more. It is not a virus, but it's actually a fungal rash, a fungus which typically lives on our skin but tends to grow in an exaggerated way. Uh, and fungus can either be dermatophyte or yeast. This one is a yeast infection of the skin. And the subtype is actually called Malassezia furfur, if you want to know a fun fact. So that is the yeast growing on our skin that causes these patches. Typically in younger adults, men tend to get it more than women. So like I said, the neck, the trunk, sometimes the arms, discolored based on your skin tone. If you have a darker skin tone, they're going to look like white patches. And if you have a paler skin tone, it's going to look like hyperpigmented, maybe brown, small patches in these areas. Diagnosis is clinical. We will see typically that it happens in human environments or places where it's much more hot. Uh, people might have it in the summer and then it'll typically go away in the winter, even on its own without any treatment. People who tend to perspire more tend to have this rash more often. How do we diagnose it clinically? And otherwise a wood lamp can help us because we do see a yeast growing in this case, unlike the virus I mentioned before. So clinical most often, a wood lamp if necessary. The symptoms, typically none. Sometimes it can itch, but really people tend to not have any symptoms, but it's pretty frustrating, annoying, impressive, whatever you want to call it, to the naked eye. So the person seems to be bothered by it because it's so widespread and they're so worried. What is this? It's everywhere. It's obvious. It's bothering me. I'm at the pool and like get it treated. So is there a treatment? Absolutely. It's an antifungal, topical, meaning on the skin, not by mouth necessarily. Uh, if you've ever heard of selenium sulfide, it's found at the pharmacy and the treatment lasts a couple days to a couple weeks, usually up to two weeks time. 
However, because of this nasty, pesty, annoying little yeast that likes to regrow, some people tend to have it come back and forth and back and forth. And for these people, we're going to recommend a treatment every month, roughly. So for a couple of days, then they're off the treatment, then a couple of days again. Next up is tinea corporis, so another fungal infection, but in fact from the dermatophyte family. This fungal infection happens very often anywhere on the body, so it'll be asymmetric. You won't have it in both sides, but you can have it on one leg, you can have it on one arm, and it can happen in all age groups. It often happens in kids, it can also happen in adults, and it's in areas where, again, more humidity, more hot, and also more crowded areas. Other thing to know about tinea corporis, so it takes its name based on anywhere it is on your body. Corporis means corporel, the body in Latin. Uh, if it's on your scalp, it could be tinea capitis. If it's on your foot, it's tinea pedis or athlete's foot, if you've ever heard of that. But for simplicity's sake, we're going to only talk about tinea corporis. What does it look like? It looks like red patches with raised exterior borders that seem to be a bit more scaly. It could be groups of patches, they could coalesce. So this one, I would suggest you get it seen and evaluated definitely by a healthcare provider. Like I said, it happens more in crowded area. You'll see it often in locker rooms. So one person will have it and then you'll see multiple with it, multiple people with it. You'll also see this in a house setting with one person having it and a few others maybe having different patches because they share their towels, their sheets, their pillows, whatever it is, it's going to propagate from one person to the next, sharing that kind of stuff and environment. Athlete's foot, many people might have it because they're all walking in the same area. That's why they say when you go to a public restroom or pool, wear your flip-flops in the shower because you never know what's hanging around. In terms of symptoms, symptoms, it's usually an itch. It is quite itchy, typically. It's diagnosed either clinically, just like that, as we see it. There's something dermatologists have, which is called a dermoscope, which is a mini, mini camera that they zoom in to see the typical features of uh, this fungal infection. We can also take a fungal culture and send it off and see what grows to also coincide with our diagnosis. And occasionally we may need to do a biopsy because this could look like many other things uh, that we see in dermatology. Like I said, common symptom is an itch and there's definitely a treatment. So one of two things, either you need a topical antifungal, you usually need a prescription for this, um, which you'll use for a couple weeks. And even after it clears, you should typically use it for a bit longer or you'll need oral. Why would you need an oral antifungal? Because the topical didn't work because it looks really complicated or because you're a complex patient, possibly immunodeficient or many other categories. So see your healthcare provider. All right, friends, last but not least, we're going to talk about dum, 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 herpes zoster virus or the dreaded shingles. If you've ever had it, you know what I'm talking about. You know I made that face. If you've never, well, good for you. Try not to get it. There is a vaccine. I'll talk about it soon. So shingles is actually a reactivation of varicella zoster virus, VZV, or chickenpox as a child. So anyone who's had chickenpox is at risk of developing shingles down the line. Why is that? Because it's actually a dormant virus which stays asleep in somewhere called the um, dorsal root ganglia. So some of our peripheral nerves in our body, peripheral because they, they, um, they take care of their response for the sensation on our skin. All right. They're called dermatomes. They represent a very specific area of our body. And I'll put a picture for that so you can kind of visualize what I'm talking about. So this virus has a dermatomal distribution because it lives in a nerve and when it wakes up, it kind of irritates that nerve that it represents. And I'll show you an image of what a dermatome looks like so you kind of visualize what I'm talking about. It's going to be unilateral, meaning one side of the body, you won't see it on both at the same time. It's typically more in elder people than younger, sometimes more in immunocompromised people, someone that's sick. But again, it's a reactivation of chicken pox, so anyone who's had chicken pox is at risk of getting it. If you have it, it is super contagious. So someone who's had chicken pox around you is at risk of catching it. If you don't, you know, do the proper precautions, keep your distance, clean your surface, clean your hands, avoid contact with that rash. So what does it look like? What are the symptoms? Typically we're going to, someone is going to experience pain in a specific area of their skin before they even see the rash. And it's like a telltale sign. Something's coming up. And then the next one to three following days, they will have little red vesicles popping up. So first red papules, red little lumps, and then vesicles, which are fluid filled little 
blisters, mini blisters, uh, which have liquid, which is super contagious. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about contagious. Because the next phase after that is actually crested lesions. So they'll pop, if you will, the liquid will leak and it'll crest over. Once it's crested, typically it's not contagious, but we still say take precaution because no one wants to catch that. It's sometimes a little bit red on underneath that. And the main symptoms is that it's burning, it's itching, and it's painful. So we want to treat it. The sooner it's treated, ideally within 72 hours of the onset of symptoms, the sooner, the less likely it is to last longer and the less likely you are to have complications like post-herpetic neuralgia. The treatment for it is our antiviral. So this needs to be prescribed as an oral medication that you take, not over the counter. You take it for a couple of days and it'll treat it. Again, will prevent long-term things like post-herpetic neuralgia and other things are pain control, topical analgesics that you might want to take. Now, what if you've missed the boat? What if it's past three days and you saw your doctor way too late? That's okay. You may or may not get the antiviral medication depending on guidelines maybe in your area, but you will still get treatment to control the pain and the symptoms. Now, how can you prevent it? Here's a little primary care in me. There is a vaccine. There's in fact two of them here in Canada that you can get. And as of the age of 50, we could start recommending it to patients. So something to consider, something to speak to your primary care provider about if you want to avoid getting shingles down the line. And that's about it. I hope you guys learned something today. Again, if you enjoyed my channel, if you enjoyed this session today, if you learned something from it, most importantly, please subscribe and share it with someone who you think can learn. Loving sharing this stuff always and can't wait to see you at the next video.